I'm Jeremy Innes. I am the Systems Management and Development Lead for Blue Waters. Uh, basically take care of operations of the system day to day and uh, do things like uh, projects that make it run better or, or make you run better on it. Um, I'm going to admit right off the bat that I got pretty liberal with the interpretation of tutorial. Uh, and I think, so my first portion of the topology uh, talk it, <clears throat> in tutorial is going to be a lot of uh, feeding you information about what goes on behind the scenes, thought processes uh, on our part, uh, different tests we've done with it, how, uh, and, and, some, and we'll get some best practices, but uh, who came here with the uh, intent to take notes on syntax? So uh, probably none, so uh, I, uh, I don't have syntax included in here, and I, I, but I do have pointers to it. Um, so I think we can be productive with that. Um, <clears throat> feel free to stop me along the way with any questions, but uh, some of you have seen this kind of thing a lot before, some haven't. Uh, this is a, a quick review of what topology awareness and, and the scheduler is. Um, this is, both of these images are representations of our 3D torus network on Blue Waters. <clears throat> And uh, the top one is a picture of job layouts. Uh, jobs are by color, uh, all mixed together. Uh, this was with the traditional scheduler where it's built into any nodes it could find. And then the bottom one is kind of uh, more of a uh, image with the uh, topology awareness scheduler enabled where these jobs are consolidated into convex cuboids uh, because that is respective of the most uh, network and route friendly way to keep these jobs from interfering with each other as well as limit their uh, communication hop distance. So as a result of that, you see some gaps in between the different shapes and things like that because different size jobs don't always fit together exactly cleanly. So um, big overview of the effects TAS has is it uh, has faster and much more consistent run times uh, for large communication intensive jobs, which is one of the uh, key objectives of the Blue Water system to begin with. Um, we see faster turnaround time for small jobs as a side effect of this because the large jobs come in as these large convex cuboids with a gap or a crack or this and that in between that small jobs uh, find a way to fit into and then they end up backfilling in very, very quickly. So in the middle of that, we occasionally are observing the medium jobs, medium-sized jobs are on blue waters are around 1,000 nodes. Um, and uh, we're some, occasionally seeing longer turnaround time for that job class. And there are some reasons for this, and we're working on, on this both in the development sense and in the policy sense to, to try and uh, uh, make some mitigations for this. Another uh, positive side effect of topology awareness is that when there is a Gemini failure, however rare, uh, the impact is actually isolated to fewer jobs because uh, when a Gemini uh, router fails, it's most likely just within a single job or across by a single job uh, because these jobs are all isolated to their own prisms. And so if it's a, a Gemini or two, uh, it's unlikely that two jobs are gonna be, uh, more than one job, it would be even impacted by it, uh, save uh, IO communication through that or something. So. Uh, there is a reduced system utilization, uh, as you might expect if you were trying to uh, keep up with this analogy of uh, 3D torus, uh, we're, we're pouring bricks into this box instead of sand, so we don't get quite the same utilization and there are more open voids, right? But um, the positive side is that we're actually getting more work done overall. So in the controlled test we did before we even decided to enable the topology aware scheduler, on Blue Waters, we saw a modest improvement in overall uh, workload throughput. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, that was pretty exciting, even at, at a modest level, because on a system of this magnitude, uh, a modest improvement is a really big deal. But then we started looking backwards after this uh, scheduler was in operation for a while to see if we could continue to validate that. And we've got Blue Waters uh, instrumented with counter metrics more than any other Cray has been or is, uh, at least until Trinity comes, comes online, which is uh, using a lot of the same monitoring mechanisms that uh, Blue Waters uh, pioneered for the first time. So uh, this is a plot of network bytes injected into the network averaged by week uh, covering 
the last six months of the traditional scheduler use uh, and the last six months of the topology wear scheduler use prior to our NSF panel review last December. And so there is some variability from one week to the next in terms of the uh, total bytes injected into the network and the average rate uh, of injection. Uh, and that varies, of course, by application load and, and what's running, uh, that's a given. But over six months time, uh, trends start to emerge and you can make this out here. Uh, if you skip over the topology wire ramp up stage where we were resolving bugs and refining policy, and you look at the traditional and TAS modes, those are each six month periods. We actually had a 42% increase in network injected, or in, in bytes injected into the network with uh, topology wire scheduling enabled. And at the same time, we had a 14% reduction in utilization. So it's transmitting more uh, using fewer nodes. Um, and over a sustained basis, what, what we really see here is over a terabyte a second uh, on, a, on average over a six month period uh, was transmitted more with the topology aware scheduler uh, than with the uh, traditional one. And that's pretty easy to understand when you look at this plot, which is uh, effectively a ratio of the bytes injected to the total link counter totals uh, of every link on Blue Waters, which means it's the, uh, the byte hop distance, uh, where if I transfer 10 megabytes over 20 lengths, uh, and if I transfer it over 10 lengths, the 10 lengths counts half as much on, on this kind of plot. So of course, because of, uh, jobs are placed within convex cuboids, hop distances are shorter, and, and they were 58% longer uh, with the traditional scheduler, uh, <clears throat> and they also overlap less. So uh, the congestion goes way down, and uh, that's why we see performance and injection rates go up. So uh, that's good news and not surprising given the earlier chart. Before I go on, any questions so far? Steve? Thanks, Greg. Uh, maybe too soon to ask this, but has anyone looked at uh, differential energy usage in the topology wear scheduling? It's not too soon to ask that. That it has, question has been asked before. Uh, we wanted to confirm first, of course, that uh, uh, we're getting these metrics to prove we're actually getting more work done uh, scientifically. That's the first and foremost, the effort. Um, and then the Blue Waters uh, energy monitors and sensors are only at the cabinet level of granularity. So there's a little bit we can do there, uh, and we can look at some broad uh, spectrum things like full system aggregate levels like this. Uh, but uh, we haven't gone too far into detail there because we're uh, deciding to concentrate on uh, expanding our metric base first and other performance counters. Um, I don't have the plots included here, but we're also expanding our performance counters well beyond just network traffic. We're gonna look at Lustre IO traffic and look, look at the impacts there and, and the rates we get. And we're also uh, tracking uh, MSR counters uh, so that we can collect uh, flops and instructions on every node, every minute uh, of all the time. So uh, we are interested in the power. We do know that as a node is used harder, of course, it does consume more power. Um, but um, that, that it's an interesting, it's a study, it's an area that interests us eventually. So, um, <clears throat> so here's where I get into uh, tips on how to get the most out of the scheduler. Um, so I'll start by uh, suggesting to recognize and use backfill opportunities, particularly if you're a smaller job or a shorter job. Uh, you get all kinds of opportunities here. Now, like around 90% of our jobs by job count actually backfill, but uh, that just means that there are a lot of tiny jobs that slip in very quickly uh, and are able to backfill. If we look at it by node hours, roughly 50% of the jobs uh, backfill and the others uh, get a priority reservation and are, are scheduled ahead of time and then uh, run in their projected slot. Um, something that uh, also helps get a uh, job started is to use a flexible wall time specification, um, and then checkpoint just before uh, you could potentially be preempted after the, your minimum wall clock. So flexible wall clock, when I refer to that, I mean that there is a uh, 
tradi uh, traditionally you can request a total wall time on a job and then you, the flexible aspect of that is you can specify another time that is the minimum time at which you would accept your job starting. And so if it turns out that you can run for 24 hours and uh, <clears throat> you can make enough progress to your first checkpoint in 12 hours, then it would make good sense to specify 12 hours for your uh, minimum wall clock time. And uh, then the job becomes preemptible after that. Um, and then it may then start earlier and get some progress made. So <clears throat> another uh, uh, tip I would want to make sure I, I recommend is don't hyper-exaggerate the requested wall time. And by this, I don't mean don't exaggerate it. There are good reasons to exaggerate a wall time, uh, just for variations in performance. Um, and you don't want an unexpected uh, job termination just because you underspecified the wall time, right? But routinely, I'm seeing instances where uh, someone will try and apply this wall time insurance, but uh, for a 12-hour job, we'll put on 48 hours or something like that. And what that does is it uh, really delays uh, their turnaround time, first of all. Uh, and that's the largest impact, is that that job takes a lot longer uh, to end up turning around and, and to start. But then it also makes the scheduler a little bit less efficient in placing that job and other jobs around it because it's assuming that it's going to run for a, a larger fraction of that requested wall time and then it can't do as good of a job either. So the larger picture is affected too uh, when this is done. But, but the largest effect is right there to, to your own job. If you're over specifying wall time, it really has a, a large impact on your turnaround time and then on the, the rest of the system as well. So all of these three things, uh, we have charge factor discounts in place uh, if you match one of these things in order to incentivize their use. So if your job's backfill, you get a 25% discount. And another one, another 25% if uh, you specify flexible wall time or, or if you hit 75% uh, of your requested wall time in your runtime and that discount compounds. So if you use these effectively, uh, like a lot of, I've talked to several of you uh, in the last couple of days that actually are making really good use of this, particularly if you've got small jobs here, finding a way to fit in there, and that's great. Um, so um, I mentioned uh, I didn't have syntax, but there are uh, flags I, I should point out that uh, someone by and large, the, uh, the placement that TAS does, or topology where scheduling does, uh, with two jobs will keep them from interfering with each other in 99% of circumstances and placements they get. Uh, there is a small chance, though, that with the right combination that uh, another job could transmit data through uh, your job with the default settings. If you're running a benchmark run or something like that or something super critical that you need to have extremely consistent guaranteed performance for or as guaranteed as possible, then there are flags to actually guarantee no other job communication interference will be possible. That does have a cost, however, in that uh, it is another constraint you would put on your job and they would have a penalty to your turnaround time because you would have to have uh, extra resource constraints um, in order to get that kind of uh, uh, guarantee made. So we don't recommend it by default, but uh, I just mentioned it here to, uh, and the instructions are in the Blue Waters portal. You can search for these job flags. They're job communication flags that you can apply that will guarantee performance if it's, if it's critical to you. There are also flags that will guarantee uh, the shape of your respective prism. Um, the dimensional bandwidth uh, of the three dimensions on the Blue Otter's torus are non-uniform. So if you get a different shape, that can change your job performance a little bit too. So if you were really, really interested in guaranteeing that you got the same uh, performance uh, from the system in terms of a network layout from one run to the next, you would probably want to guarantee your uh, prism geometry as well. And the scheduler has options for uh, requesting that. But again, it's yet another constraint and it will impact your turnaround time if you have a specific requirement like that. Um, <clears throat> something else I, I've discussed with some of uh, you here in the past couple of days is checkpointing. Um, some of you are, are doing it very, very effectively. Um, and I just wanted to mention and remind that we have a uh, optimal checkpoint interval calculator on the Blue Waters portal uh, that is tuned into the Blue Waters node failure rate, and which is an input to this equation that calculates this. It's based on uh, John Daly's uh, optimal checkpoint interval uh, publication. 
And so that's been coded into the portal in a simple form uh, with just uh, very few inputs that are pretty simple and it'll, based on your job size and uh, the failure rate uh, of nodes for the type of resource, it'll crank out, uh, oh, and also your checkpoint cost, it'll crank out what your optimal checkpoint interval would be. Also on the portal, uh, we graphically represent the command output of the show backfill command or show BF command. <clears throat> and we maintain this, so it, if you're trying to uh, come to Blue Waters and get a job running uh, with interactive kind of response time, or you want it to run now, you can go and see what nodes are available right now with no other reservation on them. So in this particular example, we see a plot for the XE nodes on the left. Um, and so uh, it's bottom here. <clears throat> um, and then we see around 200 nodes uh, would be available, or almost 200, uh, for a certain amount of time. And uh, maybe I'll just pick this lower example. If I wanted 100 nodes, I could get them for about 21 hours. Or if I made a 20 hour request for 100 nodes, it's probably gonna launch right away, and you would be able to get that. So these, these plots are pretty handy and meant to encourage uh, use of backfill as well and make it as easy as possible. Um, I mentioned wall clock accuracy, and so just uh, before putting this together, uh, I um, went and snapshotted what our last two and a half weeks of wall clock accuracy were. We've had 71 different unique users running, and what these are is over the past two and a half weeks, their average wall clock accuracy. And so we see a lot of them on here under 50%. That means they're, they're drastically under specifying their wall clock time, unless it's some other anomaly, like maybe they've had a uh, job launch failure that which can that can introduce these uh, kinds of results too in the, in the larger average until we uh, filter those out. And they're not filtered out of this particular representation, but it does give an idea that there is a lot of variation in uh, how well people and jobs are using uh, the wall time that they request. And so if these things are all over 60%, the scheduler can be that much better uh, for everyone else, in fact. At, uh, placing these jobs into areas where they will fit and uh, run them to the expected time and make a better plan for the future that's more efficient. Yes, Tom. This is probably an obvious question, but just to make sure it's clear for everyone in the room, if you request 24 hours and your job runs for 10, how much is your allocation charged? Is that a trivia question or just for me? <laughs> now, you're only charged for use time. Uh, that, that's a good question, though, uh, and a good thing to make clear. So you can request as much as you want, and what it does is it only hurts the scheduler's ability to do a good job, and it hurts your own turnaround time. But you're not charged for anything more than you use. <clears throat> okay, so uh, some priority issues. Uh, switching gears for a second. Um, when we uh, we have uh, regular communication with our scheduler vendor and with our with also with Cray, our machine vendor, and uh, we have lots of different issues that we track with them, but uh, the top priority issues I just want to share with you. Uh, we've had a job dependency reliability issue. Uh, it's been recently fixed, so if you've been uh, told that job dependencies are unreliable and holding out on using those when they'd be useful to your workflow, uh, you can go ahead and uh, start using them again. Uh, <clears throat> uh, because by all the testing we've done, it has shown that they uh, are back and functional and reliable again. Uh, iteration time is another great focus of ours. And this uh, iteration time is the amount of time the scheduler takes to compute each sample at any point in time of what the future projection looks like given how many, what jobs are in the queue and their uh, relative priorities and what nodes are available. And all it does is sit there all day recomputing this over and over and over again. It takes about five minutes normally, uh, anywhere from two to five minutes, I, I guess. And uh, we'd all love it to be faster. Uh, but this kind of thing does limit the interactive job response. So if you're running Q sub dash I to submit a job, you're likely to see a few minutes of wait. And it's because of this. Uh, it's doing a lot of computation. There is a, uh, uh, a heavy uh, calculation that expands with uh, the number of nodes and number of jobs. So the real reason we would like to see this get better is so that we can make the uh, scheduler actually calculate deeper uh, and further into the future. And so since we prioritize large jobs first on Blue Waters, um, 
I mentioned that some of these mid-sized jobs are not getting these uh, reservations and, and they're falling a little bit behind getting pushed out. If we can make that reservation depth deeper uh, <clears throat> and um, calculate uh, for more jobs into the future, then maybe we can reach further in and reach some of those mid-sized jobs to give them a priority res reservation too to ensure that they aren't uh, getting left behind and getting pushed out by uh, the regular priority job flow that uh, runs in front. So uh, that, that's ongoing. Uh, the efficient job dependency trains, uh, I've talked about this with several of you as I've sat around the dinner table. Uh, I've been trying to identify uh, those that have job dependency trains that uh, have similar job sizes and because we're considering uh, augmentation external to the schedule that we'll put together in terms of logic to help facilitate uh, job dependency trains to continue to run back to back as long as that pipeline is kept full. Uh, when we do develop this, uh, we will certainly be talking about it on the monthly user calls. So we do have uh, user calls every month that uh, we talk about highlights like this and we uh, get input uh, and we hear about problems from you guys. So I'd strongly encourage to uh, participate and, and join in with those. Uh, they aren't always as exciting as symposiums, but, uh, <clears throat> but it is a good, it's a good forum to, to find out what's going on with the system and, uh, and get latest news and also share your own uh, uh, workflow concerns. So uh, another, uh, Major issue, uh, since we are encouraging preemption, minimum walk clock time specification uh, to help uh, take advantage of every idle known node that's available and make progress with it, we would like to be able to give an application a warning signal that comes before the kill signal uh, with sufficient time so that uh, uh, your application could uh, trap that and then decide to write out a checkpoint. <clears throat> And this is not a new concept, it's just a broken concept at the moment, and uh, it's a bug that needs to be resolved. So <clears throat> right now what, what kind of happens is uh, the warning signals do get sent, but then shortly after that, the kill signal gets sent too. As I was describing this to someone uh, at dinner this week, it uh, kind of came to mind uh, that we have a ED-209 kind of checkpoint warning system. So. This reference is going to be lost on any of you that weren't alive in the late 80s or that had the better judgment not to uh, have this media reference. But, uh, but yeah, so we would like to get this resolved uh, and uh, fix it up. So <clears throat> I do want to mention uh, challenging job mixes. Uh, this is a uh, kind of a 2D uh, representation that is applicable to all schedulers, all systems where it's a node width by time and jobs place and uh, just like 2D Tetris, you want to pack this as tightly as possible. Uh, when Blue Waters has a policy that prioritizes large jobs or high queue jobs, it makes this uh, all, the, all the more difficult to piece together in a way that packs tightly. And then further complicating that is when you uh, add the location aspect into this. So when you, this gets even uh, more complicated uh, to apply when we're talking about the, um, <clears throat> the 3D torus. And so you see a void here uh, uh, on this diagram. It's probably draining for a larger job. It would just take one little job out in the middle of that void somewhere with a 48 hour wall time to uh, completely hold off the large job with all the resources drained around it for its reservation while it uh, uh, continues to try and run. So um, that can be fairly costly and for that reason, uh, <clears throat> We take those smaller jobs that uh, well, we characterize as long and narrow, uh, and we fence those into a particular region of the torus to help protect those, uh, the areas uh, of those large jobs that may run uh, from getting fragmented uh, by sparse small jobs that are out there running for a long time. And we don't, we, we, care, we move this fence when it's needed. Uh, so we don't artificially backlog the long and narrow jobs. We aren't holding those back anymore, but we do contain those and, and we keep them to an area of the torus by the demand that they have. The other uh, challenge uh, is uh, wide and short jobs. And so uh, these are allowed because they are necessary uh, on occasion, it, or sometimes that's just the only way someone runs. Some, sometimes you can run for 22,000 nodes, 25 minutes, and it's strong scalar and that gets the work done. Occasionally I see a 10,000 node job that's 10 minutes long with another 10,000 node job that's 10 minutes long just following it. And 
There's no good reason why both of those should be in the queue at the same time and not in the same job. Uh, if they're separated by job, that means they could be separated by some other job that jumps between them, like a high queue job uh, that's narrow, and then you pay that drain penalty twice. So those are just some basic guidelines of uh, things that we observe. So. Um, and so just a quick example of what that drain cost looks like. Uh, uh, say an 8,000 node job waiting to run, and uh, this bottom plot represents about 18 hours of time, and you can see when it begins to drain for it. Uh, this is a utilization plot, effectively. And uh, a few small jobs can run in there, but unless you've got the perfect job, the perfect size job, the perfect length job at the perfect time, uh, you're going to pay a penalty and a drain penalty for doing that. And we could have a much deeper backlog of jobs and have a much greater chance of having that job diversity to get the better utilization. But uh, if we have that deeper backlog that would help that problem, then that means there's a deeper backlog and everybody's waiting longer to to run work, so it's a delicate trade-off that uh, we're continually balancing. So lastly, I wanted to make sure I mentioned serial jobs. Uh, topology Aware Scheduler was created uh, not terribly with uh, serial jobs in mind. Serial workloads don't see a benefit from TAS. Uh, they don't communicate with each other between nodes, uh, or at least not much if they do. <clears throat> and um, there are different circumstances with different solutions. So. Uh, at first, uh, you might think that small fill is good, and it is good, uh, provided that the job count doesn't get too high, because the scheduler uh, algorithms have, uh, have functions that blow up uh, when job count gets too high, because it also uh, is multiplicative by node count. And so we've seen that happen where iteration time then expands along with that, and the scheduler starts having an un unacceptable response time. Um, small fill. Another uh, requirement for small fill to be appropriate would be that the task length would need to be short. Otherwise, you end up with lots of jobs scattered all over the place, and you, after, as, as the large jobs that they surround clear out, you end up with a fragmented, uh, sparse set of jobs that nothing else can run in other than other very small jobs over time. And then you run into the count limit again, and, and so that becomes a problem. So then we have the other option of bundling these small jobs. And then when you bundle, we have a topology aware constraint, which means it's going to take a little bit longer to run uh, a larger job. So you also want to pay that drain cost only if the task length is gonna be relatively long. Otherwise, you're gonna end up building out a wide and short job again, which is costly for the drain cost. Uh, and you also hope for within the job that the task lengths are relatively consistent. I'm just about out of time here, but I'm almost there. Um, <clears throat> the um, so that's just so you're in for job efficiency and how well you're using the nodes for how much work you're getting done is good. Uh, we do have enhancements coming for this, uh, developing in the scheduler to, to better support these things, to work faster and to be more efficient and have faster turnaround time. Uh, so these recommendations will change, but uh, overall, everything is different case by case, so we really recommend that you submit a service request if you have this kind of condition, because we can definitely, in almost all cases, help you with a better solution that's better for the system, better for you. And right now we have a task subscheduler. Uh, there are many solutions for this. Uh, one we're uh, using on Blue Waters at the moment uh, is Swift. Um, Galen Arnold can certainly talk at length with you about that if you've got a uh, lots of serial tasks. <clears throat> and then, um, Lastly, if the large job you're running, uh, if it's built of serial jobs, it's very likely that uh, it's going to be a flexible node count that you're able to use. And the topology where schedule allocates a prism at a time. So sometimes there's a leftover remaining portion of a plane. Uh, if you've seen the topology, uh, the torus visualization, you've probably seen this once in a while where there's an edge left open on a prism and nothing's running in it. Um, the allocation isn't of, for the job isn't charged that, but those nodes are not currently used by anything else. So if, if the job size is flexible, it's a good idea to try and expand that out to fill as much as that as possible. Uh, and with uh, serial jobs, it's, we, we consider that a high likelihood. Or even if you have a, a couple job where you can vary the job size, that's also a good idea. And if you're ever interested in what that volume is for a job, you can use the check job uh, command, and it will output uh, some numbers. One of them is called internal fragmentation, and that's the percent of those idle nodes uh, that's recommended there. And so we can definitely help to provide recommendations if you have large jobs you're considering like this. So 